Hey guys, this is uh, another Q&A episode where I just take a few questions that I received in the comments and um, just give my general thoughts and ideas on that. Uh, and I hope that someone will find it valuable. And before I start, as always, I want to say that nothing here is medical advice or psychotherapy advice. I'm not a medical doctor or mental health professional. So um, I'm just someone who has gone through experience of insomnia and learned something uh, uh, along the way. And now I'm just sharing my general thoughts and ideas. And I hope that it might be helpful for some people. And if it's not helpful for someone that is still fine, everyone's journey is different. Everyone's experience is different. So we are here to learn. So with that said, um, I'm ha I have uh, basically four questions or four comments that I wanted to uh, include in this video. And I'm gonna, you know, just uh, do one by one. Um, okay, so the first question is from Andrea. And um, actually I have two questions that I, that are kind of the same. So maybe I will just read them both and then, you know, answer at once to both of them. So the first question is from Andrea, uh, who writes, how do you cope with having insomnia and responsibilities at the same time? For example, a job and inability to focus, having to go somewhere or do something, but you are too tired. Uh, or did you cover this already in any video? And then there is another uh, person who asks, uh, Noam, uh, who asks, when you were in a really bad spell, what was your approach to dealing with the stressful conditions in life? For example, you didn't sleep at all for a few nights and then you had a stressful day of work, school ahead of you. Did you take mental health days or just push through this comfort? I find those two questions kind of like related because it's, um, it's, it's a certain type of fear when we are afraid of having a, a bumpy sleepless night and then having to uh, deal with the next day's responsibilities. This is quite common question um, and common concern. So I would say we all had it at some point of our journey. Uh, so I just want to kind of uh, comment briefly on that. Um, maybe just, uh, just to add here my personal experience with that. Um, of course, I had this uh, concern. Uh, my normal pattern or typical pattern during that time was that it was not really tiredness that was my particular uh, problem. It was more actually the lack of tiredness after not sleeping for a long time. So that was kind of freaking me out. So every time I felt tired, I felt more safe because I was like, oh, I didn't sleep and now I'm tired. That's normal. Um, but I know that there are some people who are struggling with the actual feeling uh, of tiredness. And the first thing that I want to say here is that I don't find it weird that we feel tired after a sleepless night or after several sleepless nights. So it's not something that um, that should not happen or like, you know, something abnormal. Uh, when we sleep less, it is very likely that we might feel tired, feel sleepy. And also what is, um, what is also possible is that we can have uh, a lot of struggle during the night. We spend a lot of energy on uh, fighting with ourselves, with worrying, about not sleeping, with, try, with trying different stuff. And then um, the next day we feel depleted. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, that fatigue may come from uh, the actual struggle, the battle with our emotions, with ourselves, with our sleep. So just seeing that, you know, the fact that we are tired might not always be attributed to the actual amount of sleep. But it also can, but it also can be attributed to the actual fight that we have with ourselves. So I would say that uh, in terms of like how to cope with that, we have options here. I don't find that uh, having one particular strategy uh, and use it at any situation is super helpful because there might be some days when we have more capacity to get on with our days and do stuff that we planned and some days uh, after a sleepless night we might not have capacity we might be very tired or we can be very stressed very frustrated that uh, um, it's not always available to us to be present 100 percent so I would say it very much depends on the situation and um even during my struggle, I always had this kind of like um, approach that if 
something like this is going to happen, then I'm going to choose whether I want to take care of myself and go easy on myself, or I'm going to, you know, push through. And just knowing that I have that choice could already free myself from unnecessary pondering and uh, trying to figure out um, how I would uh, act in a certain hypothetical situation. Because I would say a lot of worry comes from thinking about things that hasn't that haven't happened yet. So for example, uh, I'm, let's say currently we are not having any stressful uh, or important event ahead of us, but our mind kind of tries to prepare us for this. So uh, it might start creating worry around like, okay, what if you will have this type of experience, then how would you be if you didn't, if you don't sleep? So we are thinking about some hypothetical situation in the future, and we are worrying about it now and now we are feeling stressed so i would say just knowing that we can provide to ourselves care and comfort when we need and then also decide based on how we actually feel in the moment that can already uh you know uh help us to feel uh easier maybe right now and then when and if such situation actually comes we can choose what makes sense for us to do so maybe if it's possible for our work we can take the day off if we really feel like okay i'm not able to focus on this and it's completely normal to take care of ourselves and uh you know uh, find support in that way or when we feel like yeah i didn't sleep much i feel tired but i think i i can go on with my day and then we can go on and in this way we can teach our brain that we don't have to fear uh sleepless night because we can still you know do some th things that we planned but uh, if, you know, if let's say we don't have capacity for that, we also can provide to ourselves comfort. So I would say just like really gentle approach here and uh, um, taking it like per situation, not as like setting it as a rule uh, might be helpful and might be kind of like liberating because we would know that we don't have to really always push through or always choose to uh, avoid certain things. Um, that can already help to for us to move on on this journey because then we can choose and also realizing that we it's not always this kind of like um you know a uh, black or white situation where we are like okay if i'm choosing to have like uh, a day off then it basically means that this day i'm gonna be inactive or completely you know um not functioning at all maybe even during that day we can find capacity to do some like basic stuff for example when i had um, such days uh, i would just uh, choose something at least one thing that i could do um, that would at least show me that i can take care of myself or i can do something even though i had this rough night before or rough several nights and sometimes this um, these actions could be even absurd like they could be like go and take shower or uh, make bed or you know uh, make myself a cup of tea or something like this but something that I felt like okay this is my task and I'm gonna do it and then count it as a in my kind of like productivity um, achievement that the the, the breaking uh, uh, task into small pieces that can also help but also knowing that okay if I choose to push through or like go on with my day and let's go to work and go you know studies whatever then knowing that, you know, maybe I don't always have to perform 100%. Maybe I can still go and I can choose to do like, say, I don't know, 20% of what I can do and and, and base um, my decisions on that that freedom that, yeah, I can, I can adjust how much I want to involve with that or engage with that day and go on with that day. So it all it's all very individual. And of course, like that depends on many circumstances. Sometimes we have available, you know, uh, option to take free days. Sometimes we don't have available. So it's really hard to give any specific like answer to this. But I feel like flexibility is something that the direction that we can explore here. So I hope that this was uh, helpful. Okay, then uh, the next question I have from uh, Maurizio. Uh, who writes, uh, Alina, I'm here because I'm experiencing the same thing after months of normal sleep. Uh, and by the way, this comment was under the video that I published recently, which was about like having a speed bump after a long time of sleeping better. So uh, Maurizio writes, uh, I noticed that brain, at least mine, creates these speed bumps in two ways. Either it creates associations with variations in details of your environment or daily activity, what if I cannot sleep without the pillow? 
what if you uh, if you have to go in that uh, new place tomorrow and you cannot sleep or it fears to go back at square one what if i experience again the whole struggle from scratch i think that both instances are connected to aspect that you are stressing the brain fears that i was only lucky in the last month and so it looks for variations in pattern that may justify new struggles what do you think about it and what's your suggestion for this kind of associations? My first choice is to challenge them by doing the opposite of what my brain tells me. In short, exposure. Is it correct or can it become a sleep effort in disguise? Thanks in advance. Yeah, that's a really good question and actually comes from a really deep experience. Uh, um, what comes to my mind as I, as I read this is basically... It is helpful to really show the brain that, you know, we don't have to be afraid of different changes in our surroundings, but I feel like we don't have to really uh, go into this with uh, the um, too much forceful uh, action. So sometimes we might uh, get tempted to prove our brain something. We can say like, oh, you are afraid of, uh, let's say, sleeping without pillow, then, then I'm going to sleep without the pillow, which... In some cases, it can be super helpful for me. It was helpful in the first, you know, parts of my journey when I was like so afraid of making the wrong choice. And I said, um, at some point, I said like, okay, screw that. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do the opposite of my brain is telling me, and we'll see what happens. And then I would, you know, learn some valuable things that I couldn't have learned if I wouldn't expose myself to that. But I know that when we try to approach it with this kind of like, I have to prove something to my brain and my brain has to learn, then it this kind of uh, force might not be super helpful or at least might not be always helpful. Uh, because what might happen is that we will uh, go through this uh, the discomfort, but we will do it without um, this gentleness, without uh, self-compassion. And we might put ourselves through a lot of fear, hoping that it will produce a certain outcome. And when it doesn't produce a certain outcome, then we are getting scared. We will go like, oh, but I expose myself to this. Why is it my brain is not buying into it? And the reason why that might, might happen is because we came into this um, exposure with this kind of like, I have to control my brain through this. I have to prove something to myself. While I believe that, as the journey goes on and as we naturally um, face the situations when things are different, for example, let's say um, we've been sleeping for a long time, great, we didn't have any problems and then we have, a, I don't know, reconstruction and we change the, uh, the position of our bed in the room, right? So it's a change. So we are going to sleep in a different position in the, on the different side and, or maybe in the different place. And of course, to the brain, that is that is a new thing. And just knowing that the brain will always react with a little bit of interest, a little bit of curiosity to the new stuff. And that is really normal. That can help a lot to not to kind of like, uh, I don't know, for, for the lack of better words, like not to freak out. So when we know that if conditions change and we have to change something in our surrounding, the brain might resist. The brain might push back on that and just knowing that if it happens and if the brain will send us all this kind of like thoughts it is still okay because the brain has its agenda to keep us safe so the only way how it can keep us safe is by you know uh warning us with signals like anxious thoughts catastrophic scenarios um problem solving um maybe some you know increase anxiety heart palpitations and things like that and when we are not surprised to see those signals this is when they don't really hold any power over us they can still arise as the as we keep living our life and and by that i mean that you know we are reintroducing our normal life after we had this struggle for some time so it is normal that when there is a new stuff coming up the brain might get a little bit sensitive and this is not something that is like we are doing something wrong. It is more like a part of the journey. So, for example, we've been sleeping much better, but then there is, a, you know, we are planning a vacation, right? So um, the sooner or later, this kind of things had to happen. And 
it is normal to expect from the brain to kind of like respond to that with a, with a little bit of caution. But when we know that this is how the brain would react, then anything that the brain would send to us would already stop being a surprise. So we would know like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going through this change and I'm sleeping in a different position or in a different room. And I know that my brain will try to, you know, warn me about that. So we become more um, observant. Uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but we become to, we take the role of this kind of like observer. We just see what the brain does and see the tricks that it tries to pull into, you know, trying to uh, make us act on that. So I feel like just even uh, noticing these thoughts, like what if I cannot sleep with a pillow or what if you have to go to that new place tomorrow and you cannot sleep? Just seeing that as the way the brain is trying to, you know, send us signals because it wants to keep us safe. And instead of instantly believing and acting on those, we can just acknowledge them for what they really are. Like, you know, oh, okay, I see what, what's going on. I see what my brain is trying to do here. Um, yeah, so I hope that this was kind of helpful. And maybe just like to comment on this, like fear of uh, going back to square one. Completely normal fear. We all had that. At least I had it <laughs> for a long time. Um, and um, what I actually learned was that we cannot really go back to square one. It, the fear can be there. I mean, the fear can be strong as if we are close to square one, but it's not to say that is exactly the square one situation. Because if we think about what was happening when we were on square one and what kind of things we knew and didn't know, uh, didn't know at the time, we could see the difference there. We could see that before we actually might have feared for our lives and we thought like, oh, there's some scary, you know, um, mysterious situation that it's happening. We don't know that it's like, I don't know, we don't know that it maybe it's like anxiety uh, that creates it. We thought that there's really something broken in us, right? And now we know that information. So the fear might be, might have a different content which is which is already a proof that it is not exactly a square one situation. So we don't have to go through the same process of unlearning everything or learning everything, relearning everything that we learned. It is more about then the brain found another kind of trigger to, uh, you know, try to bring us back to the game of fixing sleep. But we don't really have to trust that we are going back to square one because we are not really going back to square one. It is like, I like to use this example of, uh, it might not be super accurate analogy, but um, imagine that I'm cooking something, right? And uh, I realize that, oh, I don't have eggs. And I go to the grocery store. And then as I'm there, I realize that I think I didn't turn off my stove. And I, and my mind starts really being like alert because I started believing that, oh, maybe I really didn't turn it off. And this is a potential, potentially dangerous situation, right? Um, so I, if I would try to suppress my thoughts and, and uh, uh, try to not be like anxious, of course, my brain will not listen to that. I would always be fixated on that. So I would have um, an urge to go back to go back home and, and uh, you know, to see whether there was uh, some damage or not. And as I would come to home and then I would see, oh, actually the stove has been off all this time, then the fear is no longer there. It kind of evaporates because the brain sees like, okay, that's not really a threat. And now let's say you continue cooking and you do stuff and then try to really get scared by, oh, I forgot to turn off the stove while you already know that the stove is off. And just because we know already that this is not true then our brain will not really respond to that the same way how it responded the first time there might be different types of fear that, that might show up uh, but i don't really think of it as something that we are uh, that we are coming going back to square one but the brain can fool us in the in the way that our reaction to this that might be strong as if it is square one, but it doesn't mean that we are actually on square one. Usually after that speed bump um, goes, you know, passes, uh, then we see clearly again that we are actually not, we are, we are not on square one, even in that intense speed bump. So, okay, um, hope that made sense. 
Uh, okay, let's go to uh, the last question that I had. I need to find where it was actually. The next question is from Mark and uh, I'm gonna, it's quite a long message. So I'm, I'm probably going to comment uh, simultaneously as I read. I will read a little bit and then I comment and so on because I, I don't think that I'll be able to remember everything that I want to comment. Um, okay, so it's been many months now and I felt like for most nights sleep has done its job. It's not always smooth and sometimes there are wake-ups but typically it's not hard. But the last few weeks it felt like a slow degradation and last night it felt like it peaked. So here are a few things I've noticed that perhaps you can comment on. Okay, so the first uh, one. I've eliminated most of the obvious efforts, but at night I was still sort of going through a ritual of setting up my phone and headphones and pillows just in case it was going to be rough. And each night I would read a little in some Buddhism book or sleep book and then switch to fantasy novel and then just close the book and lay there just trying not to try. And usually I would just wake up at 6.30 and great. Uh, but I had a ritual, uh, but, I, but, I, but I would sleep. This felt a bit like the truth, uh, truth example where it was working, uh, but also there was residual resistance. I had the thought that perhaps to move forward, I need to stop creating this little safety blanket that I had created of being prepared just in case I didn't sleep. So left the headphones in the drawer, all in effort to say I'm not going to let it control me. Yeah, I think it's it's generally helpful direction just to see that we don't have to be dependent on certain rituals for our body to produce sleep. And I would say that um, letting go slowly and gradually of all our safety nets in the long run, it's helpful because it sets us free. It sets us free from not being dependent on a certain order of things uh, um, for example, like let's say when we stop being interested in certain, let's say, uh, we stop being interested in a sleep book, right? Or um, Buddhism novel or whatever, fantasy novel, what Mark writes here, right? But then we would feel like, oh, but but then, but then I still have to do it, you know? So there might be some kind of like uh, the brain's attempt to uh, make sure that sleep is going, going to happen. So sometimes these kind of turbulences um, are helpful for us to see that we don't have to really rely on the ritual for sleep to kind of like work, air quotes, um, because essentially it is not the, the ritual that makes us sleep. It is the body that does the job. But when we fear that something is really um, controlling our sleep and if we take it away, then it's so we are going to have a rough night, that's in itself that can create a extra hyper arousal, but then seeing it, um, can be helpful but again just like I mentioned earlier is that we don't have to really do it on purpose maybe we can take it really gradually um, just to see if uh, sometimes when let's say we forget the headphones and then see like yeah then, then I'm gonna you know do this night without headphones or I'm gonna you know spend this evening without reading a fantasy novel so and let's, let's see what happens as opposed to trying to uh, on purpose take away all safety blankets at once. So I would say that general uh, or gentle approach here might be um, quite helpful. Yeah, um, so I will continue. I also noticed that I would find my mind still in the morning doing sleep math, and then I would quickly tell myself, don't do that, you don't need to sleep uh, inside. I'm wondering, as you said in your speed bumps videos, uh, if the efforts get smaller or harder to see, perhaps this is one. Or sometimes I still find myself being post with making plans for the future. And then my thoughts do a quick fear thought about my sleep. And then I remind myself that whatever, and yet it's still there. Yeah, it's it's really normal that the mind will show up when we are doing something new. And just like I said in the earlier um, uh, question, in earlier like uh, answer, that you know, for us as we start reintroducing our life and living living our lives as we did before insomnia, we are going to do new things, like new new old things or old new things. I don't know how to say it correctly. So, which can be seen by the brain as you know as potential threat 
as potential disruptor of our sleep. And of course, it is very natural that the brain will try to protect us from. So I find that uh, when we think about future plans or we think about something new and a thought pops up in our mind, it is not that, you know, oh, the fear is still there. We haven't looked at it properly. It is just the brain um you know exercising its right to keep to keep us safe and it's um it, it is this residual residual control mechanism that is not necessarily um a sign that we are doing something wrong i i usually uh uh you know present this analogy with the uh, with the with a fan you know uh when you have like a fan plugged in and uh, you take it and unplug it for a while, it might still rotate. It will rotate, actually. It will not stop like instantly. So in a similar way, how our brain, even when we unplug our like attempts to control it and we just really let things be, for a while, it is normal that the brain will keep sending us those thoughts. And to be honest, like when I started let's say writing my blog and uh, you know sharing things that i've learned and you know sharing my my story i i knew that my brain would actually uh be cautious of that i was prepared and that's what actually was happening because that's what when my brain was like was sending like yeah but you 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 shared this um are you sure that you are safe are you sure that you're okay and these thoughts would be still happening but i was prepared for them i was uh, I knew that the brain has to do what it has to do. And I know that, you know, um, in itself, those thoughts don't mean anything. And I can just like let them be there. And paradoxically, they were there for, for quite a long time. But with time, what I would notice is that they would appear less and less frequently. And there would be moments when I would just even forget about that. Forget that I ever had like a sleep, you know, uh, situation uh, in the past. And then the moment when I remember, like, hmm, I haven't had thoughts for a while. And then the thought would come up, oh, yeah, you haven't had thoughts, but what if it, they come back? And I was like, yeah, okay, then they will come back. And um, non-resistance to thoughts is something that sets us free from them. So it is not really um, a marker of doing something wrong because we have those thoughts. It is more that we keep showing ourselves that we, like, the brain can come up with a bunch of thoughts. And it most probably will, especially when some thoughts are labeled as undesired. And for me to really be free from those thoughts, I had to normalize them. I don't know any other way of being free from thoughts like this without um, understand or without seeing them as uh, kind of like safe to experience. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Yeah. Okay, I'll continue. At night before bed, the fears, thoughts about will I sleep, will it, uh, what will happen, uh, and reminding myself myself to just let it happen, pop into my head. Yeah, it's 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 normal. Like for for a while, for for me that was also the case for quite a long while actually. They flutter about while I'm watching TV uh, with the wife before bed, maybe while I'm brushing my teeth, and then fade. There seems to be residual resistance here. Um, yeah, it's 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 really normal that that thoughts pop up, and then you also notice that they fade. And this is, I would say, the key into understanding how the thoughts are, and that we don't have to be afraid of having them because thoughts are fleeting, and they are fleeting the moment they they became more fleeting the moment when we realize that they are okay to experience. So, and and you have actually the the experience that they do fade. Um, Okay, so uh, Mark writes uh, further. So it feels like perhaps I'm at this place where there is this truth plus residual fear that has me in a speed bump that, as you said, your uh, said your plumbing analogy, per perhaps there are tiny little bits of sand still there. I would love to hear you dis dissect this residual resistance truces and the speed bumps. Yeah, I would say... <laughs> I recognize this uh, pattern of thinking in uh, when I struggled with this tiny little, you know, uh, residual fears. And what I found was that not always you can trace back the source of anxiety. 
and sometimes the actual like quest of trying to really get it like okay what is it what is it I'm really afraid of sometimes that can be a rabbit hole on its own so um, when I would find myself being stuck for a long time into trying to figure out like what is it why is this residual theory still there um, and I couldn't find the answer then at some point I had to let go of the need of of always having the answer if that makes sense because it feels like we always we have to know the answers we have to know what is going on because in knowing that we have the sense of control but again like uh, we don't have this direct control over our our emotions over how fast we fall asleep or how how many times we we wake up or how deep our sleep is we don't really have control there and uh, trying to really always have the reason or find the 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 source of that that might be what's holding us back so sometimes being uncomfortable with uncertainty or uncomfortable or being comfortable with not knowing something and allowing ourselves to not know something that can already bring peace and sometimes when I would feel like um, uh, one of the like, you know, later speed bumps, they would be happening. And I'm like, okay, I, I really don't know what is this time. Then I would just attribute it to some like, okay, well, it's just one of those nights when I just don't know what's the answer. Like what's, what's the reason? And I'm just like, okay, I'm allowed to not have, you know, I'm allowed to not know the reason for that. And interestingly, with uh, within quite... Like, you know, uh, after some time, because I'm, I'm kind of normalized this, the fact that I don't have to know the answer. I don't, and, and the answer I don't know is actually sometimes an acceptable answer. That helped me to really uh, become more accepting of the place where I was, which paradoxically led to uh, less bumpy nights and uh, kind of navigating myself out of the, out of speed bump. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so in final uh, part of the message, finally last night when I found myself not falling asleep, I saw your video about the speed bumps and at the end you spoke about getting cocky and how you you thinking that you could just get through it, but actually that approach just made it worse. I just told myself, well, I'm in a speed bump, so yay, I'm going to learn something new, but let's just be calm and move through it, but I also don't want to approach the speed bump wrong. Perhaps you have more insights here. Yeah, it's this feeling of this kind of like overconfidence after we slept well, and then we feel like yeah, it's 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 a feeling of yeah, feeling cocky and and uh, um, super super confident is usually that precedes this kind of like a longer speed bump because I feel like whenever we we have like a hundred percent certainty in something like oh I know how to handle this, that's usually a control mechanism that's uh, playing out. I find that um, being humble or or um, uh, what's the right word? Um, humility. These are very helpful mindsets on this journey because it it kind of like takes away our arrogance in this kind of like oh I'm I'm the one who controls stuff. I'm the one who always knows stuff. I'm the one who cannot afford to not know something because there is um, in that confidence there is a lot of potential speed bumps because then when things don't go our way we get easily frustrated and discouraged while um um i but but this is what i want to i want to share is that um we feel like in in the end of our journey as if we are a better ver version of ourselves than as when we started this journey and this is potential mind trap because we are not really better in a sense like even when we, like in the end of our journey, we still don't know how to control sleep. We still don't know how to make a speed bump shorter. We don't have those, we don't, the, the only thing what we learn from there is that we are safe, no matter what happens. But it is not to say that we have, we got something, we got some secret, we got some like um, special uh, trick that we can always use and it will always work. And I would say that, just seeing that, you know, like you are not, um, you're not a better person than when you started this journey and uh, real, and, and, and even like applying this beginner's mindset, this like 
learner mindset, this is what can help us to not get caught up in this kind of like overconfidence and um, that leads us to this kind of struggles. Because for me, that was very tempting when I started um, doing more content like this. And uh, of course, I start suddenly started feeling the pressure of the identity of being a coach and uh, or being someone who talks about this, about this process. Because then it kind of like it, it, what the mind played trick on me was that it made me feel like I'm not supposed to have a crappy night. And that played with my mind. Like, I was like, oh, I felt the pressure. Like, oh, now I'm talking about this, but I'm not supposed to, you know, I should be like somehow better than I was before. And that arrogance, that kind of like um, the, the the desire to, to know everything, uh, always uh, have the right answers, uh, always, you know, or the one who has some secrets, that was actually uh, the uh, the mind's trick. But the moment when I would actually adopt again this kind of beginner mindset is like, yeah, I don't, I don't control this. Like, and the fact that I, I talk about like this, this journey doesn't mean that I control sleep or that I'm supposed to somehow, you know, make sure that I will never experience speed bumps. And that just knowing that that I'm, I'm not better or worse than I was before, it helped me feel free. And this. Uh, and and this kind of like mindset of of like yeah like you're you're like you're like student student for for your life basically this helps to feel so liberated so free and paradoxically this is what brings like the true feeling of peace not being okay with not knowing how things actually uh work like like i don't i still don't know how sleep happens and that doesn't mean that i have to know that but I know that whatever the night looks like, it is still okay. It is still allowed. And uh, there is nothing I, I, I have to do. There is nothing I, I can do basically to make sleep happen. And this is what brings back this kind of like magic. It's like the stuff is like you're not trying and sleep just happens. And you don't really care how it happens. And you don't really like analyze it. So I would say really applying even that mindset where we are like, really the beginner mindset we are still like we are learning and and this journey of learning and understanding ourselves is deepening with each um with each step so we might cover this like okay i understand a lot of things when it comes to sleep but then i realize like oh but there are other areas of life where i could apply the same principles that i learned in in you know in other areas of life and this is something that is like i believe is it's a lifelong journey. It's like something that I still like, I look at certain areas where I feel like anxious and these are areas that are not related to sleep. They're related to something else. And I'm just seeing how the mind play, plays the same tricks as if it played um, before, like during my insomnia. So that is helpful. Like really adopting this uh, um, mindset of like, yeah, I'm just, you know, uh, it's okay to not know something. It's okay to not have like always the answers. Um, and accepting that that is what's the the actual where, where the actual relief can be found yeah I hope that this made sense I think I kind of like <laughs> was speaking for quite a long time but I hope it made sense to some of you if it didn't so um, that's also okay um, if anyone has more questions you can also write in comments I cannot promise that I will have the capacity to answer all the answers or you know include uh all all the questions in this kind of type of videos um but i hope that some of you found something valuable in this and uh i just wanted to thank you all for watching and uh yeah we'll see each other soon bye